I, like probably many of you, am trained as a computer scientist, and theory is one of the most important parts of a CS major's education. Understanding the abilities and limitations of the computers we use, and how to think about algorithmic problems, is useful for anyone. This is all kind of an excuse for my wanting to speak with today's guest. Michael Sipser is a distinguished theorist who serves as the donor professor of mathematics and a member of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. He authored the widely used textbook, Introduction to the Theory of Computation, that many of us who have studied theory have spent some time with. We spoke about how he thinks about the theory of computation quite broadly, a number of important papers and results from throughout his career, and his interest in the P versus NP problem. I'm very excited I had the chance to sit down with Professor Sipser and talk through his perspectives on science and the theory of computation, and I hope you enjoy this episode. This is The Gradient Podcast. I'm Daniel Bashir. Here's where I tell you to do all the things about subscribing and following us in all the various places that you're able to follow us. Instead of filling this time with sponsorship ads, I'll just ask you to leave me a rating, to share this with your friends, and anything else you'd like to do. It helps me a lot. Thanks. But now, without further ado, Michael Sipser. So, Professor Sipser, I think I and a lot of people have been very familiar with your work. You've published probably the most widely used textbook for for theoretical computer science. You've made a lot of really interesting contributions to the field, but I kind of want to understand a few different things. So as we as we start getting into some of the specifics of your work, I'd, I'd like to understand a little bit about what motivated you to study theoretical computer science. Um, first of all, I probably, I, I would guess that my book is not the most widely used. Uh, I, it certainly on the, um, the, uh, more computability and complexity side, I think that is true. But if you want to just include algorithms, which is certainly a branch of theoretical computer science, I would imagine that there's at least one other textbook, the, you know, the Foreman, Lyserson, Rivest. CLRS. Yes, I, it's, it probably has uh, uh, outsold my book by a significant margin. I would imagine. I don't know for that. For that. Um, but uh, yeah, and a lot of places have picked up my textbook, which is uh, which is uh, <laughs> yeah, you know it makes me feel good, of course. Uh, but uh, so, how did I get into this field? Well, uh, I. Loved math when I was a kid. Um, my father was a high school math teacher, and he always used to bring home problems, and uh, uh, I just enjoyed it. I uh, um, was good at it, and um, I found it, you know, it just was a, resonated well with, with me. And um, I also got into computer programming very early on, also through my father. Um, you know, when I was in uh, high school, he uh, there was a he was teaching at a university in upstate New York, and they had a computer there. And I uh, he enrolled got me to enroll in one of you know very early Fortran course, and I really <laughs> loved that as well. Uh, that was really fun, and so I spent the whole high school. You know, I knew more about that computer uh, than anybody else <laughs> on campus. It was, it was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And so it was a sort of a blend of mathematics and computer science, which was what drew me into doing theoretical computer science it was sort of a natural, um, blending of those two fields. And, and so I, uh, I did that. And then within that, I kind of got drawn into what I felt was sort of the more fundamental kinds of questions. Those are the ones that appealed to me. Well, you know, um, I like questions that are, that feel to me very, um, I mean, I, I, you know, applications are nice. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly happy to do work that people find uh, uh, is useful for them. 
but I, I, I'm, I'm, I think of myself as an explorer. Um, I, I like to, uh, I like to, you know, when I find questions that just seem interesting and somehow deep and important, and I, I, I don't know how uh, to characterize that exactly, but that, um, uh, you know, that it's questions about the nature of computation itself, um, rather than how do you solve some particular problem uh, more quickly. Um, you know, often a lot of the work that goes on in the algorithms field, which is, I, I'm not trying to, it's just a different matter, a matter of different taste, but, you know, people would try to find improvements, better data structures and, um, ways of, uh, um, you know, better, you know, implementations. And it just didn't, uh, those just didn't uh, draw me in as well. I, I didn't find those questions to be as exciting. And um, and I, uh, I I I I was interested in the you know the nature of computation the nature of proof you know sort of what makes things tick you know at a, at a inter internal level um, rather than um, what seemed to me to be more um, addressing very specific problems I, I like I like things that sort of not, we're not tied to a particular problem, but so sort of about computation and, and its nature and what you can do and what you can't do. And I also was kind of uh, drawn to uh, problems involving computation where you're trying to improve impossibility results. Uh, and the most famous of which is, of course, P versus NP. But, you know, you can really think about them in a much broader context of, you know, uh, problems which are unsolvable by algorithms, you know, undecidable problems, um, and, uh, you know, problems which, which, which you cannot do in various other models of computation, not just polynomial time. And uh, to me, you know, the, the reasons why those kinds of questions appeal to me is because by um, understanding what the limits are, you really have to understand the computational model in some fundamental way. Um, and not that, uh, and not to, uh, you know, for me, the, the, uh, you know, when you're proving an impossibility, you're, you're proving that there's no way to solve a problem. So you really have to understand it's, you're talking about all possible ways. It's a, it's a very kind of sweeping sort of a statement that you're trying to make, um, rather than finding a particular way of doing something. Um, and, uh, those solving something, you know, for me, the algorithms were almost like accidents. They're almost, I don't know, you, I'm not sure what your background is. Are you a mathematician or computer scientist? I did uh, math and computer science. Okay, fine. Um, so you know what I mean by when I say something is a counterexample. Yeah. You know, uh, it's just an example of something. Uh, the, you know, the algorithm is almost, you know, uh, something that stands in the way of proving an impossibility. Um, and so I, uh, um, you know, for me, the algorithms were there just to get shed light on proving, uh, help direct my thinking about what's impossible, but not, I was not looking for algorithms as a way of solving particular problems, even though that's kind of a, per perhaps a perverse way of looking at things. Um, but I, uh, anyway, so that's maybe a little bit of a rambly, um, description of how I got ended up doing both theoretical computer science and partic the particular part of com theoretical computer science involving complexity theory that I ended up doing. There are three different directions I think I want to go based off of your answer. So I will I will start with one of these and, and we'll see how we how we make it to the other two. But when it comes to the sort of research questions you mentioned you're attracted to and, and the differentiation you were making, one thing I, I often hear about theoretical computer science in particular, and I think this also applies to other subfields like machine learning, is that there are different forms of satisfaction people find in pursuing different types of problems. And so one of the ones about algorithmic work that you mentioned, very specific problems, seems to be that satisfaction of getting to solve a really hard math problem. And I think this kind of manifests in seeing a lot of maybe former math Olympiad people go into really interesting careers in theoretical computer science. But then on the other hand, another distinction somebody kind of made to me who was more of an ML researcher was 
you can do that. You can solve really interesting problems. You can improve the state of the art. You can find a better bound on, on something. But then you can also, to what you're saying, look at the more fundamental, as it were, maybe creating a new research area or, or kind of planting a flag on something new. And I'm wondering if that's a distinction that sounds right to you or, or maybe how you think about it. I, I, yeah, I, I think there is some of that that, that, that rings true for me. Um, I, you know, I, I am more drawn to problems where we don't really have any good precedent for how to go about approaching them. You know, I, you know, I, I would rather um, try to uh, explore an area where there are no, there's no map, there are no milestones, there are no signposts. It's just you're out there kind of grappling with something with your bare hands and you don't even know how to start. Um, that's the kind of thing where I feel I'm, I'm better at. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's my own, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, again, I'm not trying to say one kind of thing is better in an absolute sense. I'm just saying what was better for me. And, and for me, you know, there are some people who are very well read and who know all the tricks. They know how to apply those tricks in various different combinations. And I'm not, again, I'm not trying to say this in any kind of disparaging way. I mean, I admire that, that, that kind of ability to really bring to bear lots of different tools on a problem. I, I just, uh, you know, reading mathematical papers is a slow, laborious process for me. And so I end up not being as well educated in mathematics as as many of my other colleagues are, I would say I'm one of the less well-educated uh, people, researchers in, in, in my field. Um, not that I know nothing, but I, and I have a sense of what's out there, but um, I'm not really up on all of the technique. And so uh, for me, I would rather work on a kind of a problem where it's not obvious whether there's any, you know, what techniques to use um, because, you know, uh, somebody else who knows all the techniques will have gotten there first anyway. <laughs> so I, um, I'm, be I'm better off and, and I, I just enjoy more things, just m trying to explore kinds of questions where it's really not even obvious how to begin. Um, and so then, uh, and I think I've had some success with that. Um, and, uh, and some, and some areas where, the jury is still out. <laughs> I'm wondering, I think that we'll, we'll kind of see what this looks like concretely when we get to talking about P versus NP. But it's interesting to me to maybe begin characterizing what it is about a problem that makes it really non-obvious what sorts of techni techniques one ought to use and maybe how that stands in the broader scheme of I suppose, the, the scientific pursuits of a given field. Um, and I don't want to try to drag Kun in here, but I, I guess I've finally been reading that after many, many recommendations. And not to say that this is something related to the whole structural problem of scientific revolutions and all this, but I, I guess I'm wondering if maybe the smaller scope question of, of what it is about a problem that makes the techniques non obvious, if you could talk a little bit about that. I'm, that's a good question. I'm not sure I can really shed a whole lot of light on that. Um, uh, um, you know, the, I, I guess there are some kinds of problems which just seem different. I, I, I just, I, I don't know if I, you know, I'm not going to be able to say this in any kind of a pre precise way, but, um, or if they are similar to, to some other problem that's out there, um, but you know that the method of solving the problem to which it's similar uh, to is just hopelessly not going to work in this case. You know, there, you know, you can argue that P versus NP in some ways, or or proving a problem is outside of P, might be in some ways similar to proving a problem is undecidable. Um, but we know, at least for problems like in, in NP. Um, 
the, the method for proving undecidability, which is a diagonalization method, at least as far as my understanding goes and my belief goes, is that, I mean, that's just not going to, it's not going it, to, you just can't, that method just doesn't work. Um, and then you need some other method, but we don't have any other methods. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just, it, you know, the, the kind of problem is just, it's just new, just different. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that people often solve, you I mean, the way you solve problems often is that you think, well, you know, how am I going to start something? Well, let's take a problem that's similar. Um, and uh, see how the solution to that one went. And then maybe you can, you know, adapt this, the solution to the one you know how to solve into the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, but if you have nothing that's really similar, then, then you're um, forced to come up with something, you know, you know, to co co completely novel. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, some of these complexity questions are, are like that, that they're just nothing, there's no good precedent. Um, and so uh, I guess that's one answer. Um, uh, and, you know, I, 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 you know, any mathematical problem that we have that's not solved in some ways, you know, you, you have to come up with some new ideas to solve it. But, you know, it just feels like they're, you know, the problems which are completely different from anything else, there, there's no even a, a roadmap for how you go about doing that. Whereas for problems that are similar, there might be some technical obstacles which sort of block you. And then it's a matter of kind of how do you put together the right scaffolding to overcome those technical problems. But sort of the... the uh, the uh, the sort of the architecture, in a sense, you know, it's more or less uh, there. Um, it's a matter of finding the right kind of meat to put on the bones. Um, but here, there's no bones. There's no architecture. There's no nothing. There's just, um, you know. A wilderness, wilderness, you know, and a, you know, a landscape which is featureless, and you know, you just don't know which way to go. Uh, so, um, I, I, I think it's a, it's a, I think that to some extent, it's a question of uh, the problems are that just there's just nothing really else like them out there, um, or the ones that sort of seem similar really aren't. Maybe that's. Maybe that's another way to put it, you know. So there, there might be some that, that seem because some I can. I'm just trying to think about how the others might respond to what I'm saying. And people say, well, I mean, there are sort of things like P versus NP which we know how to solve, but they're those, but they're really not like P versus NP. They're different. Um, and I think that you can apply that to you can say that about other kinds of problems which we had, you know. I'm not enough educated in mathematics to to really say, but. You know, there are some very simple problems in number theory or, or, or in some other um, uh, fields, in, say, in combinatorics, where we just don't have any kind of a clue. Um, and things because those problems are just fundamentally not similar to things that have been done. And so you, it's very, very hard to get started. It's interesting to think about at a very high level, what you're saying, P versus NP, it does bear at a super bird's eye view, some structural similarities to other questions we could pose about different complexity classes. But I suppose when you when you dig a level deeper, really, it's asking a question about, there are these two objects that we understand we have definitions for, and we're trying to study them, and we're trying to examine the relationship between them. And so the problem itself is really getting at that, what is the relationship between these two things? And perhaps given the fact that we don't have a proof for this yet, that relationship, there is something mysterious and, and complicated about it that we just haven't figured out the right, I guess, um, maybe maybe uh, maybe I should invoke Kun here. I don't know if it even makes sense, but there's like a maybe an almost metaphysical, like what it is of the relationship that's really weird. And at the moment, for us kind of ineffable, but then we we maybe need to formulate 
the the right language. Um, I don't know if that that makes any sense at all as, as a way of. Yeah, I, I I would say it differently. You know, it, I I think the two things that you're trying to contrast are P and NP. Is that is that fair? I I, I wouldn't. I I I I I don't think about it that way. Um, it's really just. It's not a matter of comparing P and NP so much. I think it's really a question of. Uh, trying to under t- take a problem like um, you know t- a- a- you know your favorite NP complete problem um, uh, you know finding cliques or f- satisfiability or or a- a- any of these things they're all, they're all as, as we know sort of equivalent to one another and um, another way of s- sort of informally saying you know um, the, p- the P versus NP question is you know. You know, for certain problems, we know of a clever solution, which enables you to find a fast algorithm. Um, you know, like if you um, want to test, um, well, you know, you, you you can pick any. You know, if you want to test if two numbers are relatively prime, you know, might be an example. Um, you know, that's a problem where you know, or or finding greatest common divisors, uh, sort of analogous to factoring, perhaps, and and the thing is that for 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 that problem, I mean, there's a clever solution. The Euclidean algorithm um, allows you to, allows you to do that, and maybe for other problems, which you know, some more difficult ones like testing if there's a matching in a graph, for example. Um, I mean, there is a clever algorithm, you know, the uh, for doing that and. Uh, uh, but, but for, for problems like satis- NP complete problems, like satisfiability, um, well, we just don't know if there's a clever algorithm or, or if the only thing you can do is just to do a brute force, uh, uh approach. And so that's, the, there's basically nothing clever to do. And so, to me, the, the the question really is: How do you show there's no clever way to solve a problem? Right. I think another way you've worded this is: Can you solve a problem that appears to require a search without actually searching? And I guess you also give the example of um, like primality testing with Fermat's little theorem. Like you can go and check every prime possible prime factor up to a certain point for a number, or you can just check with Fermat's little theorem and you've got it. Right, or so, or things that are related to that extent. Yeah, I mean that's a little bit of a you know Fermat's little theorem is is sort of in the spirit of these primality testing algorithms, but it's it, it's you know there are details there that have to be addressed if you want. I'm just trying <laughs> if you're going to quote me on people are going to quibble about Fermat's little theorem is not exactly doesn't exactly work, but it comes close, and it's basically the starting point for thinking about some of these other things. But yeah, that's right. So that gives an example of a s- clever solution to um, primality testing. But uh, where, where you know, naively speaking, you would need to brute force it. Um, but for some of these other problems, we just don't know if there's a clever way. And so we suspect there isn't. But th- that's, the pro- that's the question. How do you show there's no clever way to solve a problem? You know, Considering that there are so many different possible clever ways out there, how do you, you know, um, prevent any of them? How do you address them all at once and say that none of them can work? You know, that, that, that's a kind of a, you know, a uh, sweeping kind of a statement to make. You know, that's a very strong statement to say that there's no clever way to solve this thing. You just have to just brute force your way through it. And so we just don't know how to answer that kind of a question. Um, so I, it, to me, it doesn't feel like just a question of comparing P and NP. That sounds sort of technical in my mind and not the, not the kind of thing that I, I would, you know, if it was just a matter of trying to, there were these two things out there, these two sets, and you want to know, are they the same set or are they different sets? That wouldn't appeal to me. That wouldn't be such an interesting thing. But this thing gets at some some more philosophical, more of a fundamental kind of a question about, you know, the nature of things. And um, that's, that's what I like about it. Yeah, I, I think I may have worded it badly. But I think that's kind of the direction I was trying to go in with like, what is what is the nature of the objects under study? And I think what you're speaking to, 
as well is these these problems are, I mean, instances of NP-complete problems. We're looking at what, again, is is the nature of these problems? Are they, like, is their nature such that they can yield to clever solutions or not, as you're saying? Um and I think we've I think we've teased this, and I do want to get into some of the interesting results later that have been shown about different ways that may or may not work to actually attack P versus NP. And I know there's a lot of back and forth on this front, but I do want to maybe renavigate our way towards some of your specific works. And to to prepare the way for that, though, I want to ask a question about something you noted earlier, where and you've kind of been noting this all the way through that. Really, the kinds of questions you're interested in are ones that say or or are deep and fundamental in some sense. And I think that this is something that you've also kind of talked about with your advisor, Manuel Blum, where he's really, he seems to have a knack for interesting, important problems. And I'm curious also for you, what it looks like to identify a problem as interesting or important, if that's something you feel is just kind of an intuition you have, or or if you feel like you've developed a a sense that you could articulate in words about what problems are deep and fundamental and why? Well, I think it's a combination. I think there I could say some things, but some of it is an intuition. Um, I'm not going to be able to give you an, you know, uh, a, a perfect um, description of what makes those uh, problems fundamental. Uh, um, but I, I, I do think that uh, problems that uh, are, uh, to me, you know, th- this, there are certain kinds of problems that people think about that feel contrived. You know, they are, maybe you set up a bunch of rules or axioms, and then you see, well, let's see what one can get from there or um uh you know how um it's uh and i mean it's that and that's kind of the opposite of what i would so this is sort of describing what i like by describing <laughs> things which don't feel don't fit that that I, I i don't like problems that feel very specialized that feel very contrived that feel like they're um, uh, they um, they're addressing only one um, something just very specific. I think I like problems that are more general that are, that have a um, that. I mean, I, I don't want to talk about it in terms. I mean, one could talk about it perhaps in terms of impact, but that not necessarily really what motivates me so much. It just feels like there are cer- cer- certain things that, which are, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to say it better. You know, get at the essence of things. You know, what 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 is, wh- how does one get, what, how does one, I mean, there are some things that feel like they're more core and some things that feel like they're more peripheral. Um, and um, what makes something peripheral? It doesn't, you know, it, it, it is, uh, it's not very particular. It's not specialized in a certain way. It just talks about. Uh, I like problems that that talk about things that are very general um, somehow, and so without a lot of conditions put on them. Um, and uh, uh, and so uh, you know, so m- m- maybe that's one way uh, of getting at it. Um, I'm not doing a great job of characterizing that. No, no, that's that's fine. I think we can maybe take this as as a segue into some of your particular works, and then I kind of want to come back to some some other questions related to academics and things like this. But to begin with, you have this 1979 paper, Lower Bounds on the Size of Sweeping Automata. And I think what's maybe interesting, just talking about finite automata in general, is something you noted earlier about methods of proof and counterexamples and how they function. And I guess one thing that one learns in a computability theory class is if you're trying to do something related to finite automata, like proving a language is not regular, you can't just say, oh, I I couldn't find a DFA for this. You have to actually construct an actual proof for this to work out. But sweeping automata are, I guess, a, a pretty interesting device that you talk about in this paper. And you show some information about their properties with regard to succinct, succinctness. Um, I'm wondering if to begin with, though, you could tell me a little bit about 
why these sweeping automata were to you an, an interesting model of finite automata in the first place? Okay, um, that's a fair question. Um, so, you know, back then I was interested in P versus NP. But, you know, so in, in trying to get a handle on how do you start, I was looking for, could, could I find a similar problem, similar, you know, something that had captured some of the flavor of P versus NP, but looked, but was uh, maybe easier. Sort of as a way of doing what I was kind of describing that, you know, maybe you can learn something from a similar problem and... Uh, there really wasn't much out there that seemed similar to a P versus MP. So I thought, well, let me see if I can come up with something of my own um, that sounds a little similar, and maybe they'll uh, be able to learn something from that. Um, and so in the case of the finite automata, so I, I, I don't know how well you know finite automata, um, but uh, somewhat. Okay, fine. So, you know, if you just take... You know, there is non-deterministic and deterministic finite automata. Um, and uh, I'm just talking about standard, not sweeping, not two-way, just the standard one-way finite automata um, that I introduced in my textbook. So uh, if you um, convert a non-deterministic finite automata to a deterministic finite automata, as we know, they're equivalent, but uh, so there's a conversion. But the conversion... Uh, as that I describe in my book, which is the standard conversion, is the subset construction, which gives you an exponential blow up. And it's easy to prove that you can't improve, that that's uh, best possible. So there, there is, an, in some sense, a very trivial case where there is an exponential difference between the deterministic and non deterministic version, versions. Okay, so that. Uh, tells you something, but maybe not that much. Uh, so I was looking for something a little ha harder. Um, so I said, well, what about for two-way finite automata, which a little bit more like Turing machines, they can move both directions on the tape, um, but they can't write. And uh, it's known that those are equivalent to the one-way uh, finite automata. But I was really more interested in, suppose you compare uh, non-deterministic two-way to deterministic two-way. And and how much uh, that does that conversion uh, blow up the size of the machine? So just as with the one-way case, the best that people know how to do involves an exponential blow-up, converting from two-way non-deterministic to two-way deterministic. But I couldn't see how to prove that um, that conversion was best possible. Well, maybe there was a there. Maybe there's a polynomial way of doing the conversion. Are you following me? I am. So um, I said, "Well, okay. Well, let me think about that." And uh, couldn't see any way to do a polynomial conversion. And so, seemed like an exponential conversion was the best possible. How do you prove that? So that seemed like uh, a kind of a toy version of P versus NP. Here's like a P versus NP like problem for finite automata, which I didn't, I did not know how to solve. Um, so converting the two-way non-deterministic to two-way deterministic. So uh, I, I, I thought, well, okay, let me think about that. Um, I couldn't solve it. Um, and interestingly, well, so I worked on a special case. Instead of looking at general two-way uh, finite automata, I looked at, suppose we had just two-way automata, which can only change directions at the tape ends. Those are the so-called sweeping automata, which I named. So for them, I could show that there's an exponential increase. But I didn't manage to answer the question in general for the two-way finite automata. And, you know, it turns out to be pretty hard. No, it's still open. You know what this is forty years later. Um, so even this question about finite automata, uh, this P versus NP like problem for finite automata, n n people still don't know how to solve that one either. Um, which kind of, you know, when I tell people that, they find it kind of, you know, surprising. 
Um, I actually don't like to advertise that problem because I think that problem is a da- you know it's it's not good for your uh, your your mental health or your career because um, you know I have told that problem to some graduate students um, uh, and people got excited things oh I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that and you know it's it seems like it should be easy but it's not. Um, and so people can waste a lot of time on that problem. Well, I just as like I spent a lot of time when I was a graduate student on that problem and I didn't manage to, to, to get anywhere with it except for that, that special case. And so, um, I, I always, when I describe that problem, I always, it, it needs a, needs like a label, like the surgeon's, <laughs> surgeon general's warning. <laughs> this problem is a lot harder than it seems. Uh, do not start to think about it unless you're ready, you know, for, you know, a long, possibly unsuccessful, uh, <laughs> effort. So, um, I, uh, so that's how the sweeping automata paper came about. It really wasn't, that was not my, that was not what I was aiming for. That was really kind of a, uh, fallback position. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the proof that I came up with for the sweeping automata is really a lovely proof. It's still, it's quite non-trivial. Even that special case took me quite a long time to solve, but it really wasn't the goal I was aiming for. Um, so, you know, I think that that result is a little bit on the specialized side. You know, it's a very kind of a little quirky model, the sweeping automata. I don't think anybody really is all that interested in that model, but that was the best I could do. I guess I, I do have two further questions about this paper in particular and kind of how you thought about the results and, and what you ultimately did prove, which was basically that for some value n, there's a language accepted by an end state non-deterministic one-way finite automaton, but isn't accepted by a sweeping automaton with fewer than two to the end states. And then I think you also proved a relationship between these two-way sweeping automata and one directional deterministic finite automata. And again, that was also a a kind of succinctness relationship. On its own, I'm wondering, given your original motivation about P versus NP, maybe trying to understand a little bit better about the computational powers and limitations of different models of finite automata and kind of understanding how this maybe fits into that bigger picture of, of different complexity classes. Did you feel like any useful insights for you or at least just kind of interesting broader insights came out of what you were able to prove in this paper? Well, you know, sort of uh, indirectly, yes, Um, which eventually led me toward a, a totally different direction. But it was during the time when I was thinking about these finite automata, you know, I it occurred to me that there might be a connection sort of, you know, sort of an infinite analog to some of these problems. You know, I mean, you know, I was also studying mathematical logic um, at the time, uh, you know, uh, the graduate sequence at Berkeley in mathematical logic, and, you know, was sort of made the kind of observation that um, the root of exponential complexity often comes from looking at uh, the collection of subsets of a set. Um, you know, that maybe comes out clearly when you're thinking about problems like the clique problem. Um, but, you know, it's really in, inherent in a lot of these NP-complete problems that you're really looking at over needing to... The brute force algorithm is brute force over looking at may, all or many subsets of, of an underlying set. And that's an exponential number. Um, you know, in the infinite world, that's already been well known that the power set operation gives you uncountably large sets um, compared with the uh, accountably large um, underlying set. Um, and so I kind of wondered if there was a connection there at some level. And so that actually, even though I don't think that really came in to thinking about the problem about finite automata, um, it was it it, it kind of lingered in the back of my mind as something that uh, could be relevant. And when I finished with the work on finite automata, and I actually didn't th- think I learned all that much about p versus np, except that 
I kind of try to uh, think about this an analogy and find some other problem where that analogy might actually get used. Um, and so uh, that led to a, in my mind, a more fruitful line of work. Um, you know, this the paper that I have about the parity function, where that uh, infinite analog was uh, an important part, helped lead to the discovery of the solution of that problem. And uh, I don't know, you know, I, you know, I know that you notice this parody, you know, the parody uh, uh, paper is one of the papers that you mentioned. And I think that's, you know, I, 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 I think I'm a little bit more, I, I think that's a more important paper uh, of mine than the, uh, the work that I did on finite automata or, you know, like holding space bounded computation. All those things are nice. And, but in the end, it, it, I think they were, you know, fishing around for some direction to go, which might be shed some light on P versus NP. And I think at the end of the day, the parody paper is perhaps better at doing that. Um, because it gives, for me, at least it gave an example of this infinite analog um, actually uh, bearing fruit. Um, so I, I don't know how much you looked into all that, but you know the 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 paper on the parity function or the result on the parity function basically said, you know, if you have a a, a boolean circuit, um, you know, ands and or gates, um, you know, if you want to make uh, a circuit that computes even or evenness or oddness, you know, the parity of of the number of ones in the coming in and in the input, it's easy to do, but you need to have a, a log with you know, the obvious way to do that is to build sort of a tree of two input parities and you get a log depth tree by doing that. And I was interested in the problem of whether you could do that. It, I mean, there was also some other reasons why this sort of came to my attention. You know, I was thinking about some other pro problems involving oracles, but but that's a sort of separate. I just became interested in this problem by itself. Um, but whether you could, um, if you allowed larger uh, gates with a great un unlimited fan in, you know, you could, in principle, solve the parity function with a two-level depth two circuit, you know, um, an or of ands, say. Um, but for that, you can also prove easily that you need exponentially large, exponentially many gates, um, two levels. But if you have three levels, then it's not obvious. Um, and so this became a circuit complexity problem where there was a polynomial versus exponential uh, difference, um, but it wasn't clear which was the, where, where the truth lay. Um, and, you know, could, could you do a depth three circuit for parity um, that's only polynomially big, or does it need to be, a, you know, more than polynomially big? Um, you know. When I started thinking about this, and then you know, in the early nineteen eighties, uh, wasn't obvious. Maybe we can dive into this a little bit more, and then come back to a couple of the other papers I had in mind, since I think you segued us really well. And I think one of the you kind of already answered the last question I had about the um, the finite automata paper, which was one of the things you've talked about in discussing P versus NP and approaches to this is that one of your ways of thinking about getting at the problem is by starting with a, a handicapped version of the Turing machine and then proving something about that and then removing some of these constraints so that you can build towards the, the full model itself. And so that was something I was kind of wondering about the finite automata paper, if that redirected you. So yes, it sounds like it kind of redirected you towards some more fruitful things like this, for example. And I guess one of the the interesting things about restricted problems always in theory is that even if the, the problem itself isn't super useful, um, in this case it, it was, but sometimes they also kind of yield different techniques that ki might come in handy later. And I think the famous um, thing out of this paper is the method of probabilistic restriction that you came up with for proving the super polynomial lower bounds on circuit complexity. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that method and its impact. Well, that method is, you know, it's a, it's a kind of... Um... Well, I, I think it has had an impact. I mean, the, you know, you see that uh, people 
applying that, there's a, there are lots of papers which use the probabilistic restriction method. Um, uh, but uh, so, I, you know, I, I'm not sure they always even attribute it anymore uh, to, to, uh, to, to my paper, but that's fine. Um, but it just goes to show that it seems like such a basic notion. Um, I mean, I think it, it fits into a broader, uh, you know, there's a lot of work. So, back, you know, there's a lot of work where you take, if you have something that's very messy and sort of unstructured, and you take sort of a random uh, slice of it, say, or you take a random projection of it or something, often, you know, that gives you, you know, so you, you, you know, you have points floating around in space, and there may be some structure there, maybe not, you know, but you, you kind of project that whole thing in some random direction. Some, you know, sometimes that um, gives you, uh, it simplifies the picture. Um, it sort of randomizes the picture in a certain way. And randomized things can, can sometimes be easier to grab, get your, to, to analyze than some arbitrary structure that you're given, which, you know, might have some, some nasty features. So, um, I don't think necessarily that my paper influenced those other papers uh, or was influenced by them, but I think it was an idea that was perhaps in the air. Um, uh, you know, back, back when I was thinking about um, uh, that problem, randomization, I, I don't recall there, was, there were other papers that did randomization um, to prove lower bounds, uh, or, or at least if there were, that was sort of you know, in its very early stages. Um, and I think, you know, this was one of the big results uh, of, of its time that sort of developed the notion that you can use randomized methods to help uh, develop uh, lower bounds on things. And so um, it's not just specifically the random restriction, which itself I think is used. I mean, I couldn't tell you all the references and all the places, but it's used. And I, I, I often see papers, which I'm flipping through saying, oh, you know, just take a random restriction and uh, so I, I do know that it's used in, in, in a bunch of other fields, a bunch of other related kinds of things. Um, but um, so I, I, maybe I'm rambling. I'm not even sure what your question is. I, I guess, yeah, it was just kind of broadly asking you to comment on, on the method. But I think that's good. Um, maybe to scatter a couple of, of trails that we can pick up on later. One of the really key things about this paper that you talk about is when you're thinking about these these lower bounds for constant depth circuits, this relates to some questions about the relativization of the polynomial time hierarchy. And I, I suspect maybe not all of our listeners are going to be familiar with the, the verbiage I'm throwing around here and how this all, all relates to Turing machines equipped with oracles and things like this. I'm wondering if maybe by way of introduction to that, so we can pick up on this later when we talk about P versus NP in full, you could maybe introduce some of the ideas that this paper introduced with respect to relativization. Well, first of all, I mean, I I, I don't know if you the readers are all going to be familiar with rel what relativization is, um, but you know, you're trying to um, you know, if you're looking at a problem like um, uh, p versus np, let's say, is our typical problem of interest, and we don't know how to solve that, um, uh, what is you know, one way to get some insight into that problem is, well, let's consider a somewhat different model where you're going to give the um, the algorithms access to some information for free. Um, and, uh, you know, that information could be, uh, you know, how to solve satisfiability problems, for example. Um, or it might be, you know, some undecidable problem, you know, something that, you know, in polynomial time, you would not necessarily be able to do. So you're really giving, you're bolstering the algorithm, you're giving the, the, the machine some additional capability by giving it that information uh, without requiring it to actually calculate the, 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 the answer. It just, you get that, you get the answer for free by an oracle. And so... Um, you know, kind of magically, you get the answer. And so, and then, you know, when the, you have that information, now you can, again, you can ask the same problem. You can have polynomial time given that information or NP, 
non-deterministic polynomial time given that information. And uh, so you have the P and NP problem uh, sort of relativized, as we call it. You know, it, it, it's, you know it's sort of the, um, uh, in this other world, you have a, this new P and this new NP, and you can say, well, are they the same or different there? And what's kind of interesting is that depending upon which extra information you give, sometimes you can actually show, well, for the, you know, that now we can actually prove that P is different from NP for certain kinds of information. And for other kinds of information, we might be able to prove P is equal to NP. So, you know, it, it really does change the picture um, depending upon what, other inf what information you're providing. And, and sometimes if you have that extra information, you still don't know. Like if that extra information was just the empty set, was would, would give you, didn't tell you anything, well, you're back to the original P versus NP problem. And there is a case where for that kind of, you know, um, no extra information, you're, that's the case where we, do, we don't know the answer. So um, there are... Uh, so there are other problems that people look at, um, whether, for example, you know, the polynomial hierarchy is infinite or not, um, or whether NP equals co-NP. I mean, these are more specialized problems, which people may not be familiar with, but there are other P versus NP-like problems out there. And you can uh, try to... Uh, you know, we don't know the answer, but you might be able to say, well, maybe we can answer them for certain oracles. You know, given certain information, maybe th at least for that information, we might be able to answer them uh, one way or the other. And by the way, you know, part of the reason that people look at these oracle questions is because it might tell you what kind of methods you can use to solve P versus NP itself. Um you know, if you have a, uh, maybe that's going to be too much of a digression, but I'm happy to go into it if sure. you want. But yeah. Okay, fine. So, um, you know, if you have a method which you can, you, you, you hope will prove P is different from NP. Um, but you can also see that that method would also work, you know, even if you have oracles in place. So that method would also show that P is different from NP, whatever oracle you give. Well, then that method cannot work. That, that, that method actually is, is a hopeless method. It will not work because we know that there are some oracles for which P does equal to NP. And so then if you have a method which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, hoped would show P is different from NP, but it would also show in that case P is different from NP for all oracles, well, then it's a doomed to failure because there are certain oracles for which P equals NP. Um, and so uh, you might as well not waste your time trying to implement that method because it's just not going to be um, enough. Um, it's not going to, it's not going to work. Uh, so, uh, so there was, you know, I remember there was some other paper um, uh, where uh, that I was reading, and um, it was uh, uh, um, it suggested. I, I don't remember the details of that paper. It was a while ago. But the, that paper was using um, a uh, oracle to um, solve some complexity problem for that oracle. Um, and I was wondering, well, maybe you can use the same idea to, to solve one of these other problems, like is the polynomial hierarchy infinite? And, um, and so I think, well, okay, can I use that same idea to, to, uh, to show the polynomial hierarchy is, is infinite? And then, you know, if you look and seeing what goes on inside the proof, there's sort of a combinatorial part inside the proof. And that combinatorial part basically led me to think about these circuits. Um, so there's a connection. If you can show the circuits um, have to be very large, um, then you can get an oracle in that would actually separate those cl classes. 
Uh, and so the, that was sort of the line of thinking, which actually led me to think about these circuits in the first place. Uh, but uh, it's, um, you know, and so anyway, I mean, that's a kind of a maybe a long story of, of how of the connection between the circuits and these uh, problems about uh, oracles. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think this this relativization note and kind of the hopelessness of proving because of what we know about these the existence of these sorts of oracles is something that comes up in your book. And it's, I guess, important to note that this is a, a negative result for proving things either way about phi versus NP. I think in the opposite direction, it's that um, like no proof of this court sort can show that P and NP are the same because it would show that, again, they're the same relative to any oracle. But then, as you said, we have oracles that we know for, for which P and NP are different. So it's like we can't prove either thing, basically, making this just a totally hopeless endeavor. I'm torn on whether to dive into P versus NP because I feel like we've been talking so much about it versus talking about some of your other papers. But I think actually it might make the most sense to dive into it. And we'll see if we have time to come back to the other papers later. Just because I think that, I guess maybe um, kind of bringing back some of the other commentary we made about this, one of the key ways to talk about P versus NP is, do we really need to search when we have what appears like a searching problem? And I think I can kind of tie in one of your other papers here, perhaps, where you you proved uh, an important result or, or an interesting result about Go, that it's polynomial space hard. And that's particularly interesting to me because I suppose the AI community has sort of come at like not fully solving Go in, in a formal way, but getting really good at Go using different techniques and maybe coming at complexity from different angles. You're in hur- using heuristics and and Monte Carlo tree search. I'm curious, before we dive in here, actually related to your result about Go, when you saw some of the systems like AlphaGo coming out that were really, really good at it, um, I mean, this doesn't really say anything about your your proof, but it's it's still interesting to contrast that with, we do now have these systems that can at least get really, really good at Go. Um, and so for somebody maybe wondering about the interaction between those two points, how you think about that? Well, I think there's no connection, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Because, you know, the, first of all, you know, in our proof, um, you have to talk about N by N go. It's not 19 by 19 go. Um, and in order to uh, basically represent your Boolean expression, as a go, uh, uh, as a go problem, you're going to need to have a, an enormous board, you know, thousands by thousands, or you know, tens of thousands by tens of thousands. It's going to be an astronomically big board, and um, and but even worse, you're going to be having to design a very very particular um, go problem. You know, very very specialized. Uh, placement of the of the stones on the board and then you're going to ask well does white have a winning strategy in this configuration or does black have a winning strategy in that in this configuration and it's just the kinds of situations that you're going to be um, creating in order to be simulating the formulas are not are going to be so artificial that the uh, the AlphaGo problems, even if you could generalize it to you know these very large boards, um, would have uh, no reference point in in terms of either human play or the kind of play that would come up if it was just playing itself a zillion times. Um, there would be, <coughs> I just don't think it would be uh, a fruitful way to try to solve those problems. Is to build the, the the Go board representation and then feed it into AlphaGo and say, well, you know, who's going to win in this situation? Because Alpha, AlphaGo, for those particular c- kinds of questions, will I, I can virtually guarantee we'll have no clue because it's just not, it's, it's a very artificial and unnatural board configuration that would never even come close to remotely occurring in a real uh in, in a real game. Um, so I think that's just not it. You know, I, I think if you want to use machine learning to try to solve 
um, complexity problems, I think you, you would have a much better shot at trying to train uh, an algorithm to recognize satisfiable formulas and unsatisfiable formulas and just give it, you know, uh, a million examples of each and seeing if you can actually get the algorithm to, to, to recognize somehow which are the satisfiable ones and which are the unsatisfiable ones. I, I would be very surprised <laughs> if that actually would work. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think the whole uh, machine learning, um, the progress in machine learning is very surprising. So who knows? Uh, but I, 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 I still would be uh, skeptical that that's going to actually going to work out. But. Yeah, I, I do think I've seen some work, and I can't remember if it was explicitly in, in the realm of neurosymbolic methods, but there do seem to be people interested in, as you said, solving things like satisfiability problems using a mixture of those methods. But maybe jumping back into kind of methods for P versus NP, one of the things I want to dive into here is the different sort of techniques that could be employed and some of the barriers we've run into. And we've already talked about one of these, which was the issues with equipping Turing machines with oracles and kind of trying to prove things along those lines. And another thing that I sort of mentioned earlier was the strategy you've talked about previously, where you take a Turing machine, you handicap it, and then you kind of work your way back up. Maybe beginning with like a, a devil's advocate question here. One thing I can imagine somebody saying to that is, when you handicap a Turing machine, it feels like you're doing something that's analogous, but the opposite of the strategy via oracles, where instead of giving it an oracle to solve something more easily, you're just handicapping it. And so I can imagine somebody wondering, wouldn't that method or that way of, that way of attack be equally hopeless, possibly for similar reasons? And I, I'm wondering what you kind of say to somebody wondering about that. Well, I mean, I, what I would say to that is um, the handicapping approach and the oracle approach are really trying to do two very, they're, they're doing two almost opposite things. The oracle approach is not trying to solve P versus NP. The oracle approach is trying to show the limits of what, of the methods that you might use to solve P versus NP. It's almost sort of a negative thing. It's trying to show, well, you know, this this strategy is not going to work. That strategy is not going to work. Um, that's what you're going to get at oracles. You're not going to get a solution to P versus NP. You're going to get, you know, um, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, the, uh, what are, these are called imp impossibility. No, they're called ob obstacle obstructions, maybe. I don't remember. The, the, these are telling you methods that are not going to work. Um, but they're not going to give you methods that will work. Now, the handicapping approach is designed to do the latter. It's not designed to tell you what's not going to work. I mean, not, that's not what it's for. But the idea for the, in the handicap approach is, well, you know, basically, when you're trying to uh, show there's no clever way to solve a problem, there were just so many clever things out there that you could do. It's just too hard to think about. So let's limit the computer to be able to do fewer things. And then there'll be fewer clever things out there. And then you have a better shot at being able to show that none of them can work. So um, at least you'll, you'll be able to get somewhere. And, you know, that, that has proven to be true. Um, now, it unfortunately, it doesn't get that somewhere is not far enough. <laughs> but at least it's, some, at least it's something. Um, and so, uh, you know, from the point of view of developing these impossibility lower bound arguments, I would say the oracles are sort of a negative thing. They're trying to tell you what's not going to work. The, the handicap methods are a positive thing. They're trying to get, help you find things that might work. So uh, that's how I would answer that. I mean, they're not really at odds with each other at all. They're really trying to accomplish almost very different kinds of things. That's a, that's a really good way of putting it. I think one of the things I wanted to dive into here was a different approach, or I guess a negative result against another sort of approach that's been talked about with regards to P versus NP. And I think the, the one that I hear the most about is this natural proofs barrier. 
And I think that one's pretty important since there's been a lot of sort of back and forth discussion about this. But as I kind of understand it, one way to say prove that P is not in P is if we start with the, the set of all Boolean functions and we show that all of the Boolean functions that can be computed in fewer than some exponential number of steps have some property of simplicity, and then some particular function in NP doesn't have that property of simplicity, then maybe we're getting somewhere. But it's really hard to find such a property that is genuinely different from the trivial property of just being computable in fewer than exponential steps. And I guess what's really interesting is that under a pretty light assumption, I think, which is that pseudo random number generators exist, which they're believed to exist, then you can kind of prove this negative property. And that seems to be or have redirected a lot of research around this problem. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the maybe key details of the ideas here and how this reframed the different approaches people were taking to the problem. You know, this, this um, natural proofs um, concept, at the risk of being a little bit uh, <laughs> annoying to some of my colleagues, I personally think that that's sort of a, a, a totally obvious idea. Um, which, frankly, I had realized even before that paper. Um, and uh, but oh, no, it doesn't. You know, that's fine. Um, the uh, which is a simply that if you're going to find a method for showing, you know, w what are we trying to do? We're trying to show that computing some function is hard. You know, um, and, you know, the function might be the, the function which tells you if the graph has a clique or not, or, the, or whether the formula is satisfiable or not, or whatever. So you want to find, you want to have some method for showing that computing those things is, is hard to do. Um, well, we already know that there are certain kinds of functions, which we can prove are hard, R random functions. Those we can prove are hard by a totally different method, which is n hopeless for using uh, to prove like satisfiability or a clique is hard. Um, and it's, it's just a method of, uh, it's, it's called a counting argument. You know, there, there are more functions out there than there are fast methods. So there has got to be some functions which don't have a fast method. At the end. So you know there are some functions out there, in particular like a random function um, with like a, you know, randomly chosen function because that's, you know, that, that will be good enough, is going to be uh, almost certainly one of these functions which is uh, hard uh, just by this counting argument. Okay. So that, that what's been known for back, you know, to probably back to Shannon or earlier. That's an obvious uh, remark. Um, but suppose, you know, somebody comes up with a method of proving clique is hard. And that method also works to show your random function is hard. Which, you know, you could believe, you know, the random function is hard. So you might imagine your proof should also work for the random function. Well, that is not likely to happen because, you know, we've known and believed in the existence of pseudorandom uh, functions um, where you, you know, have a pseudorandom number generator, you know, and, you know, we, uh, th there are actually some formal results about that, but just at an intuitive level, there are functions that you can compute that look you know, very, very nasty from, you know, they, 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 look, they, look, they look random. They seem to share all sorts of, you know, like the digits of pi. You can compute that, but it's probably random as hell. Or, you know, it's probably going to be from the perspective of, you know, any kind of statistical tests, it's going to pass them all. It's all, it, I mean, this is like very random. Um, and I think there's things that, I don't know if they can prove anything about it, but it seems extremely likely. Um, so uh, there is, you know, we can take as a, as a reasonable assumption that there are pseudo random functions. 
things that you can compute, but they have they pass you know pretty much all reasonable statistical tests for randomness. Um, now, I would say that those the random functions and the pseudo random functions are kind of combinatorially indistinguishable from one another. So any method that you're going to use that's going to work on proving a random function is hard is also going to work to prove a pseudo random function is hard. Because it's there from a combinatorial point of view, they're kind of indistinguishable from one another. Um, so uh, the combinatorics for random functions and for pseudo random functions are going to be basically the same. But then you've got a contradiction because you know pseudo random functions are easy. So the conclusion is that whatever method you're going to use to prove your clique problem is hard cannot work for a random function. To me, this is obvious. But I think that's basically the meat of this um, natural proofs paper. And, you know, people may feel like, well, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I know that a very celebrated result, but to me, that's a kind of a one-liner. But maybe, maybe I'm a... Maybe I'm being a sourpuss. <laughs> That's, yeah, that, that was kind of what I understood from the paper. And I know that they did a lot of work to, to formalize this result as well. It does sound like there's been some pushback on it. And I'm kind of curious how you think about, it seems to be there, there's some disagreement, but I know there was a paper by Timothy Chow, I want to say, called Almost Natural Proofs. I don't know if that's something you've been no. following. Okay. No. Um, he... I think talked about, I haven't gotten a chance to read the full paper, but he says something about how a natural combinatorial property satisfies these two conditions of constructivity and, and largeness. And he says that if we weaken one of those conditions, I think the largeness condition very slightly, then the natural Proust barrier result kind of breaks down. And that what he calls almost natural properties actually provably exist under the same pseudo randomness assumption that is made in the natural proof barrier result. I guess I, I am curious, this result was obvious to you. I'm wondering if there's been kind of follow on work, maybe making similar statements about trying to redirect the sorts of ways we can go about this problem that have stuck out to you. I don't know it. No, I haven't followed it. I, I and I don't really have any thing to add, maybe I'm missing something and, and I should be paying more attention to, to the literature. I'm sure that's, um, I mean, that, that's never been my strong, strong point is to be following all these things. There's so much out there. And especially, you know, I was more focused on administration for many years than, than, than keeping up with what people have been doing. But um, I, uh, I mean, my, my, my working hypothesis on thinking about problems like P versus NP is that you're not going to, you have to take advantage of special features of the, the hard problem. And it's not going to be, um, whatever method you're going to come up with is, you know, if it's going to work on a random function, then, you know, it's just, you know, it, it's just not, uh, it's not a, not a good approach. Um, so I, Maybe there's something new out there that uh, says that this is wrong. And that would be interesting to know. But I, I, I so I, I don't know what the conclusion of this kind of, uh, uh, this paper you just referred to is whether that, you know, that it could be okay that a, the method for proving a, um, you know, could work for uh, a, a random function as well, and then you know you, it skirts that issue. I, I have no idea. I think that's a conclusion he's trying to get to that you can, like loosening some of the restrictions on on what it is to be a natural property, you can get some other sort of property that then actually is useful in the way we want with respect to proving these differences. The natural property would basically, you know, the property of being hard would be, I think, the property that we're talking about here. Um, and I, you know, so however you're going to define hard. So he's going to, be, you know, have a much more uh, liberal notion of what hard could be, I suppose. Um, but, you know, you have to be able to be able to get your hands on that notion of hard in some sort of with some sort of combinatorial, you know, analysis. Well, maybe.
you know, you know, you know all of these things in some sense are a little bit uh, hot air because nobody knows how to solve these problems. But uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I, at least I'll, I'll apply that to my own um, speculations. You know, until you really know, until you really have an answer, you know, it's just you know, you know, who knows. I, I guess I'm wondering maybe for, for a last question on P versus NP, one of, I guess, the, the kind of interesting anecdotes about your own thoughts on this is you're losing a bet with Leonard Edelman uh, about P versus NP being solved with a proof that it's not equal to NP by the end of the 20th century. And I guess given that it remains to be solved, I'm curious if you if you still maintain confidence that we're going to get to it by, I don't know, say the end of this century. Well, I don't think I'm going to get to see that one unless there's a big medical advance. Uh, no, yeah, I'm an optimist. You know, some people ask me, well, maybe it's independent. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm skeptical of that outcome. You know, just, you know, just because we don't know how to solve it doesn't, you know, it seems like, uh, <laughs> you know, a very bad case of hubris to say that, well, we couldn't, we haven't figured out the pro- the answer in you know seventy five years or wh- however long it's been, and so therefore it must be that it's independent of <laughs> the axioms of mathematics. You know, well, you know, I think I, I don't know. That doesn't see. I don't buy that. And also, I think that um, P versus NP, you know, it doesn't have the character of a lot of these other. Well, it doesn't have the character of other problems that have been shown to be independent of axioms because, you know, those things have to do with really exotic notions like, you know, sizes of infinite sets or making infinitely many choices and things like that, which are, you know, you can imagine that that's, those are qualities that are very finite based axioms, you know, might not be able to deal with and and resolve. Um, But P versus NP seems so concrete so uh, finitary itself that it would be, I think, you know, very, very shocking if it turned out to be independent of our basic axioms of mathematics. Um, except, and I think there was one little tiny doubt that I have that goes against that idea, which is that because P versus NP does is a fundamental question and speaks to the, you know, the nature of what is a proof, for example, and, you know, when you can prove things and in, in, and in, in that, in, in, and in, and by doing that, it kind of is a question that is related to the foundations of mathematics. And so the f- questions about the foundations of mathematics have sometimes been independent, you know, really for different reasons, more for the reasons that are closer to, diagonalization sort of girdle type work rather than the independence uh, proofs of, you know, Cohen and, and so on for using forcing. But still, you know, it, it seems like it opens the door a crack to independence, but I still wouldn't bet that way. I would bet that it is just, we just haven't found the, the clever idea, which is what we're going to use, need to, to, to show that P is different from NP. We, we began this interview by talking a little bit about the ways you think about approaching and and kind of picking out questions to solve. And I want to maybe use the last couple of minutes here to talk about more broadly, I suppose, the experience of spending most of your professional career in academia and how you think about academia as a result of all of that. And I'm aware that you did spend a bit of time at IBM research. And I guess I'm wondering really broadly, though, given that you spent so many years within academia, how you think, how you think about, um, I, sus- I suppose, especially in kind of this modern day where a lot of people really feel like you need to go into industry and have lots of compute and money to throw out problems to do anything that to them is quote unquote useful. How you think about, I guess, the broader role of the academy in, in computer science and engineering? That's a super broad question, but I- I'd love to get your thoughts. I, I think a big part of you know, being at a university is training uh, students. And um, even if you don't have the resources to compete with Google and, 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 so, and Microsoft, you know, in, for making your uh, 
the latest and greatest, uh, you know, language model system or whatever they're called, uh, large language models. You know, the, um, you know, there's lots of other interesting things to do. Um, and, uh, and you still need to, you know, st students need to still have a process of, you know, of, of, um, you know, of working on different kinds of problems. And um, eventually, maybe they'll end up at a place like that, or maybe not. But uh, I think, you know, there is, you know, these, these companies don't even try to get involved with the education. And so the universities have a role to play in, in, in educating students. Um, you know, it's not a perfect process, but you know, what is? Um, so, um, and I mean, that was a big part of the reason why I left the corporate world, because I, I just get a lot of personal satisfaction out of teaching and working with students. And I have no regrets that I uh, ended up spent my career at a university. Uh, you know, and maybe you didn't have access to certain tools, but, you know, the kinds of work that I do doesn't require those tools anyway. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, um, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're not trying to solve corporate problems, you know, that these companies are trying to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just don't buy that argument that, you know, that what we're doing is better done or, you know, at, at, a, at a company. Yeah. I mean, for certain very, you know, you know, for, you know, for a while, um, you know, various different, uh, you know, operating system research was going on in um, at the university level, and maybe still is. I don't follow that stuff so closely, but um, you know, uh, you know, MIT was a leader in developing interactive computing, for example. You know, or, or, or multi interactive computing and multi user computing. Um, you know, hard to even imagine, but you know, uh, the notion that you would have time sharing. Um, you know, as a concept, you know, so that was developed at MIT and, but, you know, I don't know how much of that kind of systems work can be done at a university anymore. You know, that's all been taken over by the companies that are making billions of dollars creating systems. And, um, but, you know, they, they built their work on the work of the, that came out of the universities. And, um, I don't think it's really the university's place to try to compete with that. Um, but there's other stuff that might be happening, you know, you know, and and that's where I would go to the kinds of questions which universe with the companies don't necessarily care about. You know, the more deeper and philosophical questions. You know, what does um, you know, I, I you know, um. I you know, for lack of a better thing, I mean, this is not exactly computational, but you know, yeah, I can imagine it has some some kind of bearing. You know, you know, what's the origin of life, for example? You know, uh, is there life elsewhere in the universe, or is there something special about, you know, that led us to be the only ones to have life um, on on our planet? Um, which I, you know, could could be the answer. We don't know, and so. Uh, you know, companies are not going to think about that. Or there might be a few people here and there in some research group, but that's not going to be their ma their main focus. But I think you know those are the kinds of questions that we shouldn't lose sight of at, at the university level. You know, those really deep questions, which really are curiosity based, and um, you know might lead to something or might not. Uh, but uh, still, that's really going to advance the human spirit in some way. And I think uh, that. You know that that's important to do too. Not only to make you know the latest and you know, the GPT, you know, twelve or, or God knows what. You know that's uh, sure that's going to be important, and maybe that kind of that's going to be a creative, and it's going to out outrun us intellectually, or maybe not. I don't know. The, the jury's out on that one. But still, you know, I think for people, we want to be thinking about those really deep questions, um, and so. Uh, and that's going to be the realm of the university. And so I'm happy to be part, part of that. 
It's interesting the way you articulate it, because even even within the realm of scientific endeavor, the motivation that you're talking about feels, sounds humanistic at, at its core, I think. And it, it does feel like the Academy is like really the site where, of course, I, I think there are different distractions in, in any environment, but I suppose, you know, you can you can still have the right kinds of incentives and motivations set up to get people to work on those kinds of problems. Well, I mean, I, if you mean humanistic as opposed to scientific, I, I, I'm not sure I would make that as a counterpoint. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some, you know, you know, we're all human and we all care about human things. And I think, yeah, it's sort of humanistic in that sense. Um, but uh, is the nature, you know, what is consciousness, you know, is that, a humanistic problem is that a scientific problem? I don't really know, um, but you know it's still an interesting problem. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, back in those days, you know, people would say, you know, what is life? You know, that was a n- nobody was. I don't think if people were imagining the biotech field coming out of that, but you know, they're people just trying to understand things. And so, I, I think there's still room for the asking those kinds of questions and 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 chipping away. I mean, these are hard problems. You know, I think people get frustrated now if you know getting an answer takes more than a year. Um, but you know, people work on those things for centuries, um, and so uh, you know, we shouldn't be you know let our frustration with progress being slow le- make us give up. Um, you know, these are hard problems, but I think, you know, we, over time, we, we learn more and we make some progress. And so, um, and I think that's, there's a role for that, you know, in the society. And so, uh, um, I don't know, that that's, that's just my, my feeling. And, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, ha- I'm happy for the companies to be doing their things. I'm, you know, I love my iPhone, you know, and I, <laughs> uh, it's great, uh, and though I frustrating at times also, uh, frankly, but, um, and you, you wonder why some of the simplest things are not <laughs> being fixed <laughs> with all their employees, <laughs> but, uh, okay. It's not my problem. Exactly. Uh, and so, um, I don't know, you know, I, I, I guess I'm uh, in some ways an idealist perhaps. Um, and I, um, uh, um, I hope there's going to remain room for those folks going forward. I think that's um, a really good point, Dan, and maybe a good place for us to end. Professor Sipser, I just want to say thank you for being really generous with your time today, and it was, it was really great speaking with you. Oh, good. Thank you. It was nice to speak with you too, Daniel. That's it. That's the whole episode. Thank you for listening. If you like this, really the best thing you can do is to leave me a review and to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting. You can also subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast player. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest from The Gradient to receive emails whenever we have new podcasts, newsletters, articles, then you can subscribe to us on Substack where you'll get email notifications for everything.